Hello, everyone. I'm Peter Coy, the president of the New York Financial Writers Association. Pleased to welcome you to our Zoom session uh, on how to write about personal finance, starring uh, Leonard Sloan, the New York institution who turned 90 this year and is continuing to write about personal finance, uh, as well as uh, a staff of people who are quite a bit younger, but, but highly accomplished as well. So starting from the top of the screen, Lauren Young, Dalla Mercado, Ron Lieber, and Jonathan Clements. And uh, Len will give them a brief intro when it's their turn. But before we turn to them, uh, I'd like to just start out by, by getting, helping you get to know Len a little bit if you don't already know him, although a lot of you do. So Len, um, just help us out a little bit. Tell, tell me how you got started writing about personal finance. How and when? How did it all come about? Well, uh, thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, uh, in answer to your question, um, I had been with the New York Times for many years. Uh, I had a lot of beats, as so many people did. Uh, I had covered Wall Street. I had covered Seventh Avenue. I covered the entertainment industry. Um, and uh, what happened was we had the weekly uh, Your Money column, uh, which uh, was uh, a regular column that appeared every Saturday. Um, it was uh, written by Sal Nusio at the Times, uh, who, who then uh, left the Times, and uh, he went to become the New York State Assistant Commissioner of Insurance. And so the beat was open. And uh, the financial editor, uh, then it was John Lee, um, asked me if I would like to do it. And so I jumped at the idea. I thought it would be uh, very challenging and very interesting. And um, that became uh, really the touchstone uh, for my career. Um, it led to so many other things. Um, at that time, uh, WQXR, which was the radio station of the New York Times, wanted to start a personal finance column. <clears throat> and so when they asked me if I would run it, and so I wrote it and appeared on, on the radio station. Uh, it ran for about 10 years. It was syndicated around the country. Um, and uh, it was a very interesting and something different for me. That I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and then a, a book came along. The New York Times owned a company then called Times Books. Uh, and uh, they wanted a personal finance book. And so they asked me to write it. And I wrote the New York Times book of personal finance. Um, and it all came from uh, the New York Times column. And uh, I really, I really loved writing it. That's great. So just if we'll wind the clock back even a little earlier, tell us how you just got started in journalism at all, your first job. Well, um, my first job was on the Wall Street Journal. Um, and um, I had uh, graduated from the New York Times, from the uh, Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, and then I went in the service. It was uh, during the uh, Korean War. Uh, I was a Navy officer and I was in the service for three years. Um, and when I got out, I started looking for a job in journalism. And uh, I'm sure all of you on this panel and probably many of the people listening had the same situation. When you're looking for your first job, everybody says to you, well, what's your experience? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I said, well, I don't have any experience. That's why I'm applying for a job. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I was turned down by lots of newspapers, lots of great newspapers, including the New York Times uh, and papers in other cities. And I was very fortunate. Uh, the Wall Street Journal had a program then where they hired young people uh, and they started them out right away as a reporter. It was, it was an amazing program. The old timers called it the genius program. They were very dismissive of the young people who started. Um, and, uh, but um, when I started, there was, you know, around that time, there were some very good journalists came out of that program. Uh, 
uh, Johnny Apple uh, was uh, was there in that time, uh, Dave Jones. Uh, and uh, what happened, uh, they, and when I was hired, there were 10 in my class of, of geniuses. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was sink or swim, as I guess so many jobs are. Uh, and, um, you know, very quickly a lot of people uh, left or were asked to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was lucky. Uh, I stayed and um, th that got me into journalism. And uh, a couple of jobs later, I uh, wound up at the New York Times. Excellent. So how would you describe how personal finance journalism has changed since you started out doing it? Well, I guess it changed in a number of ways. But one thing that strikes me immediately is that personal finance writing has gotten more personal. Um, I, I say that because uh, when I got started writing personal finance, we could not use the word you in the column. We had to say one. When one buys an IRA or when one wants, uh, a, uh, well, one wants to uh, invest in an annuity. Uh, and I fought for years to be able to say you just to say the word you, because to make it personal, it was people, you're writing to, to people. And I said, when you uh, buy an IRA, and when you uh, buy an annuity. And finally, I won that battle after fighting with editors for a long time. Uh, but now that seems very quaint because uh, I keep reading, I see I and me in just about every column I read. Um, you know, when uh, when I said to Mr. Jones such and such, or uh, Mr. Jones told me this, it's it's all over the place, and not just in personal finance writing. Uh, it's all over the newspapers and all over all of journalism. Um, I, I don't know. I, I get a little uh, leery about it, but maybe that's just me and, and my age. Uh, but I think um, you know, there's too much. The, the writer is in it too much. Uh, however, I, I see that all over. And so uh, I think I'm, uh, I'm sort of swimming against the tide. <clears throat> By the way, I don't think I'm the only one who thinks that. Um, uh, Brett Stevens, the New York Times opinion columnist, had a column last month in which he talked about this very thing. And he also thought perhaps there's too much of the I in the, in the writing. Mm -hmm. So, um, Let's see uh, how, how this progresses. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, it won't, maybe it won't last. Maybe it'll be a fad, but <laughs> okay. let's see. Uh, just one last question before we join the panelists. Uh, do, you, do you have any quick thoughts about where you see personal finance journalism going from here? Um, well, I, I think um, personal finance journalism is really needed very much in this day and age. Um, th there are so many more young people investing, for example. Uh, and I think a lot of them really don't know what they're investing in or really don't fully understand it. Um, we saw this last year with uh, Robinhood and the MAME stocks. Um, you know, hundreds, thousands of young people invested and um, it led to, uh, you know, a complete confusion uh, that really should have been, could have been avoided. Um, I also think um, uh, the documents by corporations and governments are getting more complicated and need uh, more explaining by personal finance writers. You know, uh, they talk about transparency, but I don't think these documents are very transparent today. Um, have you looked at a 10K lately? Um, it's uh, pretty tough slogging through. So um, this is something that we can help people understand better, I think. Uh, and of course, there's the whole area of uh, cyber currency, which uh, is so confusing to so many people. And I think they need explanations of these things. So I think that there's gonna be a, a great need for personal finance writing in the years ahead and uh, let's give it to them. So great, uh, Len, now um, you, you're gonna switch roles and put on a different hat. And instead of 
at answering the questions, you start asking them and I'll step back. Although I will help field questions from the audience and folks, uh, folks on the call, please drop your questions into the, um, I guess we'll do, use the chat rather than the Q and A, use the chat room to put in your questions and I will uh, select from them. Uh, and Len or I will select from them and bring them to the panelists. So Len, over to you. Okay, thanks, Peter. Well, um, we have a very distinguished panel of uh, personal finance writers with us. Uh, you see their pictures on the screen. Um, Jonathan Clements, who spent decades at the Wall Street Journal. Um, Ron Lieber, who is the Your Money columnist for the New York Times. Uh, Darla Mercado of uh, CNBC.com and uh, Lauren Young of Reuters. So let me start by asking the panel, uh, one of the questions that Peter asked me, uh, how did you get started writing about personal finance? Um, let's start this in alphabetical order. Uh, Jonathan, how did you get started? When, uh, when I got out of university in England in 1985, uh, I had already spent you know, time studying economics. I'd already worked for a suburban newspaper actually out in Washington, DC. So I had some journalism experience and my hope at the time was to join one of the big London papers. But uh, you know, the man who bookended my career, Rupert Murdoch was busy busting the unions in particularly the print unions in London. And so I thought I had an inside line on a job at the, the Times of London and the Daily Telegraph. Suddenly their interest in hiring some, you know, snotty nosed kids fresh out of university disappeared. And I ended up on a uh, international finance magazine called Euro Money. And then from there, after discovering that the standard of living for junior reporters in London was terrible, um, from there, I moved to New York about 13 months later and ended up as the lowest form of life at Forbes magazine as a fact checker. And that was where I first became a mutual fund reporter. And then after a couple of years at Forbes, I got hired away by the journal. So that was that was how I ended up in personal finance. But in many ways, it was always my interest from very early on. I'd been studying economics in school since I was 16. I was it may not be fascinating to everybody else, but it was fascinating to, fascinating to me. That is fascinating, yeah. Uh, Ron, you're next, what do you think? Sure, yeah. so, uh, you know, I spent eight or 10 years uh, sort of bouncing around the canyons of New York trying to figure out um, mm -hmm. what it was that I was put on the earth to do journalistically. Uh, you know, I was at Fortune for four years. Uh, I wrote about careers, I wrote about management, uh, went to Fast Company for four years. I I wrote about design um, uh, first and foremost. Um, all along, I had this personal obsession with the frequent flyer mile. Um, you know, I collected them, I used them, I abused them, I broke rules, I followed rules, I took all sorts of great trips. And I had this idea uh, in 2001, early 2001, um, that I was going to write a book that was going to be sort of an epic biography of the frequent flyer mile, kind of the you know, greatest promotion in business history. Uh, and um, I pressed save uh, on that book proposal at 2 a.m. on September 11th, 2001. And nobody wanted a book about the airline industry anymore. Um, but all along, um, you know, I'd started reading the Wall Street Journal right out of college and just could not put it down. Um, it was, uh, you know, just the, the incredible feature writing, uh, you know, was something I'd wanted to do. I tried to do in 1994. I couldn't get hired. That's why I went to work for business magazines in the first place. And then in early 2002, I got word that they were starting this uh, personal journal section, this consumer news section. And I'd been doing a lot of service journalism um, back in the 90s. Those of you who are around to um, to see it will we'll remember that, you know, service journalism was considered sort of like third class work. Right. It wasn't like the fancy, important stuff, but it's what I wanted to do. I just couldn't figure out exactly what it was um, that I was going to do or how I was going to make my mark there. And these two editors at the journal, um, Edward Felsenthal and Ibram Shapiro, sort of sized me up and they said, you don't understand what it is that you do, do you? <laughs> and I said, try me. <laughs> and they said, your beat is beating the system. 
And as soon as they said that to me, um, you know, all these doors and windows started flying open in my brain. And pretty soon I was doing stories for personal journal after I got hired, like, you know, how to return your wedding gifts for cash <laughs> and stuff like that. And, you know, it turns out that like everything under the sun that hits you in the wallet um, is personal finance. And, you know, three years in after I got to, you know, sit five cubes away from, uh, Jonathan Clements, you know, sucking up every last word of his investing wisdom and philosophy. When they started the Saturday newspaper, they said, you know, there's room for another personal finance column here um, because all of the stuff other than investing is stuff that we basically just like haven't paid any attention to. Um, and so they gave me a column and suddenly I was a personal finance columnist, um, you know, which came as a great surprise to the economics professor in college who gave me a C plus. And I've been doing it ever since. A couple of years later, the Times hired me away, and now I sit in your old seat. That's good. Thank you. Okay, Dala, tell us uh, how you got started. For sure. So I started my career at uh, Investment News, uh, formerly a Crane newspaper. Um, and it's a trade publication for financial advisors. So when I uh, initially had started on, uh, my boss at the time, Jim Pavia, essentially threw me to the wolves and was like, okay, we've got an opening for a life insurance reporter. Mm. Life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that was where essentially where I had started and um, it was kind of a scary time. Um, I didn't know much about the beat. Uh, you guys know from your reporting how confusing and complicated life insurance can be. Um, you know, I was writing about annuities as well. And a lot of this turned into um, coming up with contacts at the broker dealers, getting a hold of contracts, reading through the contracts, you know, trying to develop sources as well who could speak about these contracts and do so in an upfront manner, you know, aka they're not making a huge commission off of it or anything like that. You know, some folks over at Morningstar, for instance, who could comment about it. So for a long time, I mean, I was really curious about um, certainly not just the motivations as far as people selling these things, but then also asking the deeper question of, do these financial advisors understand what they're selling? Do their clients understand what they're selling? Um, and, you know, some of the things that I'd come across would be these annuity contracts that were hundreds of pages long. And I'm like, okay, no one's looking at this. Absolutely no one. So, um, that sort of became a crusade for me. Um, and it was what had spurred me to get my CFP. I became a certified financial planner. Um, and I was working on that over a couple of years. Um, <clears throat> after working at uh, Investment News for eight years, I uh, went over to CNBC. They had an opening on the personal finance team over there. And at the time I was kind of more of a generalist. so. I had more of a consumer focus, but still wrote about saving, investing, taxes. Um, I had my son in 2017. And when I came back um, that December, that was the December that the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, was signed into law. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to go and focus on this and find as many peels off of it as I possibly can. And so that was essentially what I had devoted as pretty much the next year of my life to. Um, and so really, I feel like a lot of this kind of comes from a, a place of trying to explain these complicated concepts to consumers and help them become educated because the idea here is, and, and you know, Len, you, you touched on this, there's this whole issue of, you know, supposed transparency, supposed disclosure, but Clients, you know, certainly investors don't necessarily understand what that is. And just because that information is there doesn't mean it's easy to distill. So, you know, I really kind of see it as a, a service, a calling for us to try to boil that down and, you know, educate the consumer. So that's what it's all about. Um, so I've been at CNBC since 2016. And then just last January, got promoted to markets editor. So still here at CNBC, but um, doing more work on the investing side, still writing where I can as well. Um, if anything, sort of focusing on this um, intersection between investing and tax planning. So 
I'm all about it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Lauren, uh, tell us about your thought. I am a butcher's daughter, but my butcher father was also a journalist um, and he was also an investor. So I grew up in a household learning about stocks. And my father, when I graduated from college, gave me a lump sum of money and said, this is yours to invest now, which um, has grown to you know, help buy a home, hopefully pay for my kid's college, all of those things. But along the way in college, I went to Penn State, I was on the newspaper and I was the campus editor and the stock market crashed in 1987. And I had to write about the university's endowment and how it impacted the portfolio. So that was really my first personal finance story, I always say. I ended up going to graduate school later on after a few years of living abroad and living in DC. I went to Northwestern and I took a business writing class um, in journalism. And we had to read the Wall Street Journal every day. And I fell in love with the Wall Street Journal like other people here, the writing, the stories, the ideas. And I wanted to work for the Wall Street Journal when I graduated. And sure enough, I ended up getting a job at the Dow Jones Newswires out of grad school, hired by a Medill person, Michael Pollack, who's married to Joanne Lublin, um, great people. And that was the beginning of my journey. I covered corporate bonds. And then I covered mutual funds in the footsteps of Jonathan for um, Dow Jones. I, my beat was Vanguard. Um, got to know Jack Vogel very, very well. Got the religion. Um, and then I worked at Smart Money Magazine. Remember personal finance magazines, everybody? True service journalism, doing all of those fun stories, the best and worst discount brokers, the best and worst mutual fund companies, those massive, massive projects that took months to complete. And then um, I worked at Business Week Magazine with Peter Coy as a personal finance editor. Um, and then finally, my last step on my journey now, I've been at Reuters for um, almost 12 years. And Reuters never really had a history of doing much personal finance journalism, but I was brought there to help them build it. And um, like everybody else here, you know, I, our stories, I mean, we used to say at Smart Money, it was actually Our Money magazine. It was the editor in chief saying, do I own AOL stock? Or the person who was getting divorced who said, how do I, how do I figure this out? So the stories really that, that I assign, and I will be honest with you, everybody else here, I think writes a little bit more than I do. I edit a lot. But um, the stories really come from the things we see and we hear and we think about, and it's always changing. The landscape's always changing. So there's always something new to write about. But then as you all know, and we can all talk about it, there's such a seasonality, like tax season is upon us now, everybody. Um, and Christmas, charitable giving, you know, all these things. So there is a very cyclical nature to what we do, but then there's also kind of the, the world's in turmoil. There's inflation, gas prices are high. So there, it's an ever-changing landscape of things to write about. That's my story. Good story. Um, okay, uh, before I ask my next question, I just want to encourage the audience to uh, ask questions, please, and uh, put it on the, uh, the chat, uh, and uh, we will try to uh, present them to the panel. Um, okay, what I'd like to ask now is, um, who do you see as your audience? when you write personal finance articles? I, is there one audience that you write for or is there multiple audiences? How do you write an article that will appeal to perhaps different audiences if you think you are writing to different audiences? Uh, what, what's your approach to get as many people into your articles as possible? Um, let's go in reverse uh, alphabetical order. Uh, Lauren? Want me to start? Sure. Yes. Uh, well, I love anecdotal stories. And th so there is a you and an I and a we, but I really love to hear real people's experiences. I think Ron does a really good job of this too. I mean, everybody does, but I really push the journalists that I work with to find real people to tell the story because it's just not as interesting. And there's like texture to people's experiences and, and very complex things and things that often um, can, there's a lot of conflict because it's not just the perfect story. There's always some weird twists. So I really, really like that aspect of personal finance journalism. I don't know what others might think about that. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we'll find out. Uh, Darla, what do you think? For sure. And no, I, I actually agree with you on this one too, Lauren, because I think primarily what we try to do, I think it's one thing to go and explain a complicated concept in an article. 
a completely different thing to show how it's applicable to someone's actual life. And that's what we want to do. Um, before I, I became a markets editor, um, I was actually pulling together a whole lot of stories on the small business loan program, the PPP, um, and speaking to folks who had been, you know, hey, I'm really on like hard times. I had to go and like take one of these loans and then kind of getting into the details of what made that so complicated. So, you know, certainly the idea that we're, we're trying to get across there, this could happen to, to any kind of regular small business owner, but we also want to make it, you know, an approachable story and, and certainly one that can that can pull the reader in. So I'm all about that. I should say the audience itself, like I kind of pivoted a little bit, but we're a very professional audience at writers. Our, our readers are, and I think for CNBC, I won't want to speak for other people, mm -hmm. but you know, we, we are writing for people who are in the markets, uh, professionals who wanted to be smarter in their jobs and know what they need to know now. But there is a very consumer end to it too, because our stuff is syndicated and it goes out to Yahoo and it goes out to all these other publications and outlets. So we do want to be super accessible for, for the general public as well. I would say we're not the super wonky. However, there are other aspects of Reuters where you'll get the super wonky, maybe in currencies or commodities. But I try to be a little bit more accessible for everyone. Okay. Ron, what about you? Ron, you're, you're muted. muted. It's the 2022 Ron? thing. You're still on mute, Ron. Oh my gosh, I'm still muted. Um, two years later. Uh, so, I, you know, I, 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 I think about it, you know, I, I guess kind of commercially from, you know, an overarching perspective. And then I think about it demographically and psychographically. Um, you know, it was not at all clear uh, six, seven years ago what was going to become of the New York Times. And, and, you know, when I got there 14 years ago, the, you know, the newsroom was, you know, maybe 1,200. And, you know, I figured it, it was going to 800, maybe lower. Um, and I, I had no particular expectation that I would be around for this long. You know, I hoped to be able to walk out under my own power, but I, I, I wasn't counting on it. And I showed up there, you know, right as things were going off the rails. Um, the newsroom is now whatever it is, 1600, 1800. And it's because we paid a ton of attention to subscribers, right? So I feel like this is very much like a service-driven enterprise. And who are these people? Well, there's two kinds of them. You know, there are the there are the print readers, which who pay an extraordinary amount of money. Um, and on the whole, um, you know, they're um, older than me. I'm 50, uh, and so um, you know, I we have a retiring column that's separate from what I do. But um, you know, I try to constantly be thinking about like. You know how how can I do um, personal finance journalism that's of interest and of use to older people um, that will feel fun and not dutiful? I'd say I succeed at that maybe two or three times a year, and it's not enough. Um, but then I also think about it demographically, just in terms of the digital subscribers who are, you know, on average people with low six figure income. So, you know, I am working in service, um, you know, to the upper middle class. And most of my work for the times, you know, over time has reflected that. But when the pandemic hit, um, we pivoted very quickly and just decided, you know, we're going to go as long as we can and as hard as we can until somebody tells us to stop. Um, to be of service to the people who have um, lost the most. So, you know, I spent almost all of 2020 just like trying to, you know, shovel useful things at anyone who could find their way to us um, who was in need. Um, and, you know, because we have really good juice with the service engines, you know, we were actually able to accomplish a lot there. So, you know, I'm proud of that. Um, but mo but I, I think I probably spend the more, majority of my time thinking about it psychographically. Um, you know, I want my readers to be, you know, of above average um, personal finance smarts. I want them to be of below average profitability for whatever institution they're dealing with. Um, and I want them to feel like, you know, they're getting away with something and that we're all in this together, and that none of us are as smart as all of us. Very well said. Jonathan, what about you? So I would say that in terms of story ideas and audience, the two great sources of 
of ideas is, is one, you know, emails, the comments that you see on stories, the confusion that you see, the things that people are reacting to. I mean, we're very privileged at this point. We know what people like what, and what they're interested in, what they don't like, and what they're not interested in. You can see it by the number of page views you get. You can see it by the number of comments. You can see what stirs up controversy in the comments section. So, you know, I follow that closely and then say, okay, this is an issue that people don't understand, or this is an issue that people are intensely interested in. And so I'm going to write about that. And the second thing, and this goes back to you moving from talking about one does this to you does this. I'm a big fan of writing about we do this and I do this because some of the best story ideas I get is from things that I'm interested in. You know, if I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do about long-term care insurance, if I'm in the middle of trying to sell a house, if I'm trying to think about how to structure my portfolio, if I'm trying to, in reaction to what's going on in the market, that, if that's interesting to me, I figure it's going to be interesting to other people. And if I tell it in my voice, if I say, you know, I'm doing this, then it has a credibility, um, I think, with readers that goes beyond sort of general sort of blather about you might do this or you might do that. On top of that, you know, as I think about the audience, you know, I run, I run this, this now relatively small personal finance site called Humble Dollar. And I have a group of 40 or 50 people who write for me. And most of these people are not financial experts. Some of them are financial advisors. Some of them are experts. Um, you know, I have had Bill Bernstein and Charlie Ellis and Mayor Stapman and so on write for me. Um, but most of them are just people who are intensely interested in finance. And I say to them all the time, you may not be seen as an expert on personal finance, but you are an expert on your own life. So if you write about what has happened to you, you tell your story, you have enormous amounts of credibility and you, whatever you're worried about and whatever you did is probably gonna be of interest to readers. So I, when I think about audience and I think, you know, I really think about what is it that is of interest to me. And if it's interest to me, then I think it'll be interest, interesting to readers. Very good. Um, Peter, I think we have some questions from the audience. Do you read uh, some of the questions? Peter? I, can you hear me, Peter? I was laughing at Ron and then I made the same mistake myself. Okay, hi. Um, Melinda Crump asks, uh, do you find it Difficult to write about investing in cryptocurrencies given the uncertainty and volatility. Who wants to tackle that one? Oh, I'm so excited about I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the the fact that it is so volatile, that it's constantly changing, the fact that we're watching it, how it behaves versus equities is exactly what we need to hit on. And I think the fact that, you know, hey, this is really, you know, it's extremely uncertain. It's, it's extremely volatile. These are all points that we need to hit. This is why we need to write about it. Um, so certainly looking at it, be it from, could be from a tax point of view, could be from a, a perspective of, you know, hey, we're investing in this. Is it, is it zigging when everything else is zagging? You know, what does this mean for, you know, the, the, the use case of, of cryptocurrency? You know, is this acting as an effective as an, an effective hedge? You know, there are so many ways to sort of take a slice off of how crypto is acting now and make that applicable to personal finance and certainly to your readers. Um, if it's acting in a way that confuses you, undoubtedly, you're going to have readers who have the same questions so yeah i i just think it's 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 a plum situation as far as you know coming up with ideas off of that it's a novel asset and and these are some interesting circumstances that we're currently in anybody else want to talk about crypto yes. so what I, if I i haven't um done a ton on crypto i've i've watched it and in, in, in 
listening to people here it reminds me a little bit about when we started writing about exchange traded funds about ETFs. They were they were new and they were a little scary and people didn't like them. Crypto is it's a little more technical in other ways because of the the blockchain and and the science behind all of it. But it is really interesting and um, we. One of the things I do at Reuters is I'm always the person in charge of, of getting money together when there's a collection that needs to be done, personal finance person. So one year, our crypto reporter had actually invested in Bitcoin just to see how it worked to the experience. So the proceeds from that sale we used to give to all the um, workers in, in our building, the people who clean and, and the janitors and stuff. So I did benefit from, from Bitcoin. I want to say that publicly. So, so Lauren, all the janitors retired as mil millionaires. Not that, like, but we give them cash, um, and we use the proceeds from from our Bitcoin investment. Uh, it wasn't today's Bitcoin, unfortunately. It was a few years ago, but we did pretty well. But, but you don't give them crypto. You give them no, you know, no. We gave them cash. We sold it, right? And right. then had to pay taxes on it. I think maybe. Exactly. Anyone else on crypto, or should we go to the next? Yeah. One? So I, I haven't I haven't written about it yet. Um, and that's neither um, something I'm proud of, um, nor something I'm embarrassed of. Um, you know, for, for a while, for a while, you know, I paid attention to it and the paper paid attention to it as a sort of technological phenomenon, you know, as more and more people piled in and it, and it became, you know, easier to store it and hold on to it. My feeling about it was I don't cover the gambling beat. Other people cover the gambling beat, let them cover the gambling. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, there's lots of people who follow what, you know, many of us know as the sort of, you know, core and explore um, form of investing where, you know, you've got 90 or 95% of your portfolio in index funds, and then you go and play with, you know, whatever's left over and you sort of take a flyer. And I don't know that this, you know, in 2022 is, is all that different. Um, but you know, I recently changed my mind about it because I, I realized that um, what I had missed in all this is that there's so much venture capital chasing the blockchain right now. And so many people um, you know, who are interested in it from an investing perspective that one way or another, all of these fancy VCs and all of their zillions of dollars are gonna will something into existence, right? 95% of these companies are gonna go away. 5% of them are going to persist. 1% of them are going to be, you know, Google or Facebook in 10 years. Um, I don't know which ones they're going to be. I'm not about to predict it. Um, but something is going to come of this. And, you know, those, those, those that, you know, become the next Google or Facebook probably aren't going to look anything like they look today. Um, but I've decided that I can't just like stubbornly dismiss it anymore. Um, and so now I got to figure out you know, I mean, what is what is there to say that hasn't been said? Um, and I don't know yet. I would stubbornly dismiss it, Ron. That's my advice. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> in my in my time at the Journal, and subsequently, I felt like one of the strengths of what I wrote when I was at the Journal and written subsequently is that I tended to try to write about things where there was some sort of positive recommendation to come out out of the story. <laughs> And I would find it extremely difficult to write a story that recommended Bitcoin. I mean, the fact is we're talking about an asset with no intrinsic value. Nobody really knows what it's worth. You know, all kinds of shenanigans seem to be going on. I just, just I would find it extremely difficult to write a story about Bitcoin or any of these other cryptocurrencies and say something positive. So, you know, his mother said, if you can't say anything positive, don't say anything at all. You know, I, I have nothing nice to say about cryptocurrencies. You know, th that's fine. And I may come to the same conclusion, but I, I, feel, I, I feel like I have strong memories of Jonathan Clement's columns circa 2004, 2005, 2006, um, that said all sorts of not nice things about <laughs> actively managed mutual funds and variable annuities and other things that, um, other things that I'm forgetting. Right. Well, that, so you, may you, true, but that may be true, Ron, but you know, there was, you know, instead of actually managed funds, you know, there were index funds instead of a high price variable annuity, you know, there was put the money in your 401k or in an IRA, right? You, you're getting this, basically the same tax advantages 
Um, so there, there were positive alternatives to that. I'm not saying I never wrote a single you know, snide column. I mean, but I try to be positive. And anyway, my hope is, you know, I, you know, that I will manage to retire before Len does. So I will never have to deal with the consequences <laughs> of my refusal to write about Bitcoin. <laughs> Are you going to retire before Len does or before you turn 90? Uh, not sure. <laughs> I think before Len, the way things are going. What, what does that word retire mean? I, I don't understand that. Uh, uh, Len, we have another question. Should I? Go ahead, uh, Sure. This, this is from Carolyn Crapo, and she says, any tips for writing for financial advisors or other professionals who want to understand their clients' needs? Somebody want to tackle that one? I think Darla I mean, should take it. Yeah, I want to hear Darla first. Yeah, me too. Oh, oh man, I was going to stand, I was about to stand down because I like jumped into that crypto. Line. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I feel like as far as, you know, for financial advisors who, who really want to tap into what their clients need, I mean, I feel like if you're, you're looking at your particular demographic that you serve, certainly it really comes down to, you know, okay, well, what are some of the issues that most of them are grappling with at this point? I, I guess just to give myself as an example, um, as an elder millennial, you know, we're at an age of, you got household formation, folks who are kind of grappling with not just, you know, the, the ability to afford a home, but then also you're dealing with student loan payments. And then I suppose for those who, you know, hey, you've got, you've got children, maybe start dipping a foot into some of that estate planning and thinking a little bit more deeply you know, about the legacy you want to, you want to leave behind, but then also certainly the plans that you might have for your kids as well. You know, this whole issue of, you know, guardianship documents, for instance. So I think it really comes down to, to targeting your writing based on the audience and the topics that are, that are most, most relevant to them, you know, based on your, your clientele, I would say. Anyone I did else? this Oh, yeah, I, I did this in a very specific way recently, um, about a year ago. Uh, my most recent book is a book about um, who pays what and why for college and when, if ever, anybody ought to pay $325,000 or if that's just completely obscene. Uh, Lauren? Um, <laughs> anyway, um, that will be me. Thank yeah. You. So, um, but I never paid for private school, Ron. And you that's did. true. So, you that's know, your, 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 your bill is going to ultimately end up lower than mine, I right. think. Um, uh, unless, yeah. That's so no anyway, um, so, uh, so I, in thinking about all of the different, you know, sort of niche markets for the book that I wanted to market to, um, you know, is the price for this thing times two kids, if you have them or three, you know, God help you. Um, you know, that's a million bucks, basically, if they're younger than 15, and they go to private colleges, you don't qualify for any need based or, or merit aid. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a becoming an ever larger thing in the offices of financial advisors. And, I, I think a lot of people, you know, don't feel a lot of advisors don't feel comfortable with the conversation because, um, you know, they understand 529s, um, you know, they used to be kind of terrible, but in the last 15 or 20 years, you know, that problem's mostly been solved. Um, so they know how to get people investing, you know, for college, say, for, for college, and they know how to, you know, sort of, um, you know, wind down the equities in that portfolio, but that's, you know, kind of a boring conversation. Um, you know, the problem with not having the other conversations with advisors, uh, with clients there is that um, this is probably like the most emotional financial decision you'll ever make if you have kids, right? You know, these are your flesh and blood or you've, you know, taken them in and adopted them and, you know, they've been with you for 15 or 20 years and now you're trying to like attach, you know, rocket boosters to them. And it is a um, fraught situation emotionally, and it's very easy to make, um, to make uh, you know, sort of default to just spending the most, because then you'll never question, um, you know, whether you did it right. And so my sense reporting the book was that financial advisors were just like utterly ill-equipped 
to lead clients um, through these conversations uniformly. Um, and so I, I built a like kind of custom crafted PDF for them that was basically, it was titled how to have better conversations with your clients about college. And I basically gave them like a script to walk through that involved, you know, 20, 25 or 30 questions in a kind of logical order, you know, with me providing commentary, like we're going to ask this next question next and here's why. And you'll see that like, we haven't even gotten, we haven't even talked about numbers until question 12. Like, let me explain to you what we're trying to do, like emotionally in questions one through 11. Um, and I, you know, made that available when I was promoting the book and, you know, send it around now whenever anybody wants it. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think what I learned from that, right, is that, um, and I think this is true of all advisors. I mean, you can be sort of a technocrat. Um, about the business. Um, and it's great to sort of, you know, dork out um, on the numbers and the Monte Carlo this and the, you know, the drawdown strategy that. Um, but, but, you know, money equals feelings, as the great sage Carl Richards said. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the only way to draw out feelings is to have these conversations. Right. So, so it occurred to me when I was done with this, like, gosh, there's a there's a template here to like do these guides for advisors in, you know, all like 25 aspects of personal finance that we all cover regularly. Like, what is the question set to have the kind of good conversation with a client that will both give the client insight, but also draw the client closer to you so you feel like you have more of a bond and then you retain them. Right. So kind of everybody wins. So I don't know. I'm thinking about doing more of those somehow, but it's, it's not really like part of the purview of my day job. But I'm glad you asked because it made me think of it. I think that financial advisors have a very unique insight into people's portfolios in the way that we only want, you know, we're asking the questions, but we don't really get to see the engine. Right. We just see the outside of the car. It looks pretty. And having that that um, viewpoint is so special and unique, and you really develop a perspective in a way because you're dealing with people on a, a much more regular basis. So I think you there's so much to write about. I guess it's just a little bit of the partnership of a are your clients okay with you sharing details if they're okay with talking to journalists if you want to pitch something or if you write about it, and you know. You, you can't be too generic with your clients because then it, like we were just saying, you need a little bit of the detail to make people connect with it. But I think that you have a lot of opportunities to write about all these different things that, that clients are dealing with on a daily basis. Death, babies. I mean, the whole life cycle, everything is so interesting and you're on the front line. Okay. Um, let me ask a question uh, now. Um, what do you think ought to be included under the umbrella of personal finance that perhaps is not included now? I mean, we all talk about taxes and investments, insurance. Um, what do you think ought to be in addition to that that we ought to get into? Anybody? Well, I think actually Ron's sort of pointed us in the direction with, with his comments, which is that, you know, a lot of the, you know, go back to the, say the, the late eighties, the early nineties, a lot of personal finance writing was really just about investing. And, it, and the purview has expanded out over the years, you know, estate planning, taxes, insurance. I mean, all of these topics are, you know, regularly covered. Um, but I think the sort of from the late 90s onwards, as we started to write about things like behavioral finance, about money and happiness, the purview of personal finance was widened further. And I think there's more room there. And this whole notion of you know, money and what it means for people is a potentially very rich area. I think it's an area where at least my curiosity, and I think the curiosity of a lot of people, runs ahead of the research that's been done on this. I would love to know more about, you know, things, issues like money scripts. Why do we believe what we believe and how does it influence our behavior? You know, how do we use money to have more meaningful lives? What does it mean to, you know, to have a, you know, a, a fulfilling financial life? You know, 
all of those things are fascinating. I think they're all within the purview of personal finance. You know, money touches everything. I mean, I, I say to people, anything can be a money story. You know, you name a topic and I can find a financial angle for it and you can write about mm -hmm. it as a, as a personal finance story. So I think the, it, the topic is unlimited. Good point. Anyone else uh, on this? In terms of topics, I do think we don't, we really do a great job of writing about saving, investing, but the actual reality, like the nitty gritty stuff that happens at end of life, there are, there have been great things written, but death is super complicated when it comes to money and all the cascading of families and wills. And you can tell people they need to have all these things, but seeing how it all plays out in, re in real time is very different than us saying that you need power of attorney. Right. But yeah. one thing, Ron, I was just going to say, Ron, your book, I think his book on uh, your, your book about um, opposite of spoiled, about raising grateful kids, that to me, that premise was like, as a parent, and I've given, I just gave that book to somebody else. Like that's my, one of my favorite gifts to give to new parents. So, and I think that that was a pretty novel concept thinking about uh, gratitude and kids and how, and, and how to raise them. So here I've gone from the beginning to the end, having babies yeah. and, and dying. Yeah. I mean, just, I'm just going to put a finer point on, you know, what both of you said. Um, you know, I think what Jonathan's talking about is, is um, mental health. Um, and money and not just like what it costs and why there aren't enough therapists and none of them take insurance and how much that sucks. Right. But, um, but, you know, just the, the connection between money and like every single possible feeling on the spectrum of human emotion. I, I, I years ago, I, I somehow caught wind or somebody sent it to me because they thought it would be useful. Maybe it was like a shrink, a shrink friend who I went with the New York um, City Psychoanalytic Society was having a like how to talk to clients about money meeting. And I, you know, I thought, oh, you know, this is going to be so juicy. And I went to the event and what it was actually about was how to how to have uncomfortable conversations with clients about your bill and about <laughs> like whether they were paying late or whether they wanted to pay less. And it was like 60 minutes of minutia about this. And I'm like, wow. Even these mental health professionals are scared to death to like have the broader conversation, right? Um, I, and you know, and you know, many of us have since seen you know the sort of rise of financial therapy. You know, Brad Klontz and Amanda Clayman. And, you know, there's people who do this. Um, there should be way, way, way more of it. I mean, many financial advisors are, are sort of um, doing therapy without a license, um, mostly in a good way, I would argue. Um, so yeah, just money and mental health. And then, um, and uh, death, and I will just put it more bluntly. Um, I think, uh, you know, in, in, in the next couple of decades, we're going to see a lot more people who are running out of money before they run out of oxygen. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I, I think a jet, uh, you know, a generation from now, a generation ago, when many of us were in, in their 20s, couldn't imagine a world where um, uh, marijuana would be legal. Um, I think a generation from now, um, uh, assisted suicide is going to be legal or basically close to normal. And the connection between people running out of money, people, um, you know, having more dementia and assisted suicide being legal is going to be just like thermonuclear. Um, so I'm trying to find ways into that, you know, now. So optimistic and cheery, Ron. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I know. It's, it, it, no, I said it's the reality. I know. I yeah. I mean, it's like, how much good news is there really? I mean, this world has only gotten more complex, our world. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it's a full employment act for people like us, but, you know, really th the only thing that's gotten better is that, um, you know, you can invest for not very much money and, um, and you can put it all in index funds. Um, it'll all probably work out fine. Thanks. You know, I would argue um, in not a small part to people like Jonathan, just like, 
pounding the table for five, 10, 15 years, you know, educating the rest of us and the world that this was a, a better way to do things. So, you know, c- can progress be made? Um, will some of this other stuff be simpler 10 or 15 years from now? I, I, I hope so, right? But like, you know, I don't know. I mean, we've been yelling about student loans for 10 or 15 years now and have done like basically no good. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I would love to, to hear, um, more optimism, um, uh, but we just seem to keep making things harder. I was, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I guess just to kind of go along that theme as well, I mean, is, is also the fact that like, you know, Hey, if you're looking at this issue of applying for social security, applying for Medicare, none of that is any easier at all either. And certainly the benefit is that, you know, we, we're all able to share information. We can kind of talk people through it. Um, but I actually helped my mom start the paperwork to go and, and prepare for Social Security. And mind you, she's like, you know, yeah, I'm kicking it early. No, I don't care. I'm ready to stop working. Um, for an older person just to go, yeah, I know, it, it's, it's been a rough year. But for an older person to go and, and try to even work through getting all of the information, working through that. Do we have enough information to, you know, see if she can, if she can compare, you know, what her income would be versus what it would be if she took spousal benefits from my dad, who, you know, she'd been married to for a very long time. Um, you know, just, just even trying to figure that out on your own is extremely difficult. And then, you know, I've, I kind of know what I'm talking about. I'm here helping her with it as well. But um, no, that that hasn't been easy, and I don't I don't see that getting any easier, even with this whole wave of retirees coming in. The dollar, you know, you go back um, to the late 1990s. I remember writing about the Social Security claiming decision, and there was almost nothing to read about it. I mean, there was so little research done it. There was so few articles written about it. And yet the decision was just as complicated then as it is now. I mean, the good news is that this topic is written to death about. Anybody who wants information about what to consider when claiming Social Security, you know, has to, all they have to do is call up this thing called Google, type in a few words, and they will have more information than they could possibly want. And that simply wasn't the case, you know, 25 years ago. Consumers, if they go looking for it, are much better equipped with information than they were then. I don't think the decision is any more complicated now than it was then. They're just have the potential to be better informed. Well, in keeping with a somewhat pessimistic uh, tone in the last few minutes, uh, let me ask you this. Um, what do you see as the major problems in financial and personal finance writing? Uh, what, what is wrong with it today and how can we fix it? Does anybody have any thoughts along those lines? Just a, just a moment before you answer. Uh, we also have a bunch of questions from the audience. So um, please answer that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cluster the last set of questions from the audience because there won't be time for everybody to answer each of them. Okay, Len, does that make sense? Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead with this one. Does anyone well, want to? The biggest problem is for me, I'm not writing for the people who really need the help and I don't think they're finding it. From, from Reuters or, you know, I hope that they're finding it somewhere, but um, the the people, the, the lower income people of this country are screwed. Yeah, and in so many ways. And getting the information to how not to be screwed is very challenging. Mm-hmm. I would say that the, uh... The big problem is that you know we all bow down before the almighty markets. They drive so much coverage um, in the business pages, and yet the fact is, you know, nobody knows which way the markets are headed next. Nobody can pick stocks that are going to regularly outperform the market. Everybody should simply, you know, buy, you know, Vanguard Total International and Vanguard Total Stock Market and call it a day. The areas where people can add real value to their financial lives is making sure they have the estate planning documents and the right insurance and they're holding down their taxes and they buy the right size home and so on. And yet these issues do not have the urgency that, hey, the NASDAQ just entered a bear market has. And so they don't get the coverage they deserve. 
you know, we, we spend too much time focusing on the markets and not enough on these broader personal finance issues where we really can add value. Yeah, I would add one other thing, which I've made sporadic attempts at, you know, more than one job at trying to solve over the years. Um, you know, I think Jonathan makes a good point about how there's way more easily accessible information about the complexity than there used to be. I think that's true. Um, but, you know, the very volume of it um, creates a sort of sorting challenge. And I think there are, you know, 25 or 30, you know, potentially six or even seven figure, you know, pivot points that people reach at various points um, in their life where one article isn't enough. They don't know how to sort from the hundreds or thousands on Google. Um, and there is no like five to 10,000 word on demand, everything you need to know where you're certain that it's completely up to date and includes all the interactive tools that you could possibly need, like that's there all at once that you can just access. Um, I don't know, you know, maybe at 901, we'll all, um, you know, raise, uh, you know, three or $4 million and just build these things together. Jonathan, you think they'd have us back at City or? <laughs> <laughs> um, probably not but I, I think that's a thing that ought to exist in the world um, and uh, I, you know I, I, and it doesn't okay thank you Peter you want to uh, get yeah. some of your audience questions yeah just want to make sure Dolly didn't have anything to say on that one you okay okay I'm good let's go to the next one okay so what I what I want to do now is cluster uh, three questions at once, but before I even do that, uh, there was somebody in the Q and A. Julian Block writes: Back in the day, Jonathan did a Wall Street Journal column on which Vanguard, Vanguard index funds to use for my IRA accounts. My creditors are grateful. <laughs> which cat? Which I wonder which fund it was. I'm assuming it was Total Stock Market. Don't know. Don't know. All right. So, so I'm clustering these because you don't all need to answer all three. So just keep in mind as I read them, which ones you feel like you wanna tackle. Um, we have uh, John Beers asking, how accessible do you make yourselves to individual readers? Do readers try to get you to give them specific financial advice? And if so, how do you handle this? Okay, that's one. Tom Miriam asks two part question first, what subjects are you asked by readers the most to write about? And secondly, what subjects are you asked by your editors the most to write about? All right, and then the third question comes from Olivia Carville who asks, how do you break into this beat if you're a newcomer who has never covered personal finance before? Anybody, maybe, maybe just structure things a little bit. Does anybody want to jump in on the first question about making yourselves accessible? To readers, yeah, I'll address that. I um, I try to make myself extremely accessible to readers. In fact, I, you know, for as long as email has existed, I've made an effort to respond to every email I receive, even if it's just to say thank you, unless it was one that you know, um, it's a considerable quantity of them actually it's said I was a complete idiot. Those I generally did not respond to. But everybody who wrote to me and just even, even if they're just saying thank you or they're writing with a question, I endeavor to respond. And I, I could claim that I was doing this as part of, you know, being a good service to readers, but also I felt it was a way to build my brand and to make sure that, you know, readers felt a connection with me. And if I figured if I wrote one email to a reader, that email was a reader for life. Great. Um... Um, anybody want to answer the question about the two parts, uh, which subjects do readers ask about and which ones do editors ask about? Okay, Lauren. Readers ask about investing. They ask about stocks. What do you think about XYZ stock? My editors ask about taxes because it's confusing to them and so they expect us to figure it out. Okay. That's great. Anybody else? Yeah, so... Um, to me, it's kind of like a, you know, flywheel effect or something, you know, readers tend to ask the most about the things that, I, you know, I've been writing about the most in the last six to 12 months. It's a lot of like, 
oh, you think that's bad? Like, wait till you hear about this, right? Or I know you wrote about that, but let's like get let's get deeper into the weeds and like deal with my problem. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes those are really useful um, ideas. Um, editors, uh, uh, kind of related to Lauren's answer, you know, um, we used to make jokes at the journal, at, at, at personal journal, that, you know, the, the top editors would, you know, come back from their Upper West Side dinner parties, uh, you know, every Monday morning um, with a whole bunch of questions that they needed answers to in their own lives. Yeah, and in the spring it was taxes, but, you know, it was often something else entirely. And so that's the sort of, you know, cynical answer. Um, you know, the answer right now for me, actually in, in a way that's more pronounced than it, than it has been at any time since 2008, 2009, is that you know that the editors are asking me to write um, more about news than they have in a decade. I mean, it's just been a really newsy couple of years. Um, uh, you know, it was newsy in the first couple of years of the Trump administration too. Um, so uh, I don't mind that. Um, uh, but you know, I, I'm now you know I've got ideas on my list that have now been there eight or ten years that I've not <laughs> to yet. And I hope to get to them. <laughs> Carla? Sure. So for us, it's always, you know, what stock's doing well, what's tanking, you know, which is all well and good. But again, you run into that issue of it being sort of a short term focus. Um, certainly as, as an editor, what I try to do is kind of flip that around and think about, you know, hey, well, what's happening to the investors in these things? What are the fees on these things? Um, for us, I would say like most most recently, everyone's been talking about those um, Russian ETFs you know, some of the trading activity that was going on there, I guess, lack thereof in this case. Um, but what I was more interested in is anything, and, you know, I try to go and pass this over to uh, the reporters on the team is, well, what's happening to the individual investors who are in there? You know, what does this mean for liquidity? Are they able to get out? Are there situations where you've got people who are holding those funds and may not even know it? You know, could they potentially be within, you know, a fund of funds or is part of a, a more diversified portfolio where you've got this Russia exposure and you don't know about it? So what I try to do then instead of thinking about, you know, you've got the mover, you've got the short term big move in a given stock or in a given fund. Let's try to go and like get the second day slice off of that. What's happening to the people who are invested in there? So that's what's more applicable to the reader. That's what folks really should be concerned about. Yeah. Um, hey, Len, do you want to ask a question? Well, no, you didn't answer the last question, which was um. Oh, sorry. How do you, how do you oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Personal finance. No, no, it's okay because I'm thinking about it. Um, I'm curious to hear what others say. I mean, I have my own ideas, but what anybody want to tackle that one? How do you break into personal finance today? You know, Don't I would tell people okay. to mimic what Darla did exactly, basically. Yeah, your CFP. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's a, like started a trade, like, you know, learn from the ground up, get an amazing credential that's like, so hard to get that uh, you know at the points at points at which I've tried I've I've been too intimidated to try um, and uh, and um, you know and then move over to the you know consumer side um, if you want to right I, mean, I mean do you regret anything? a lot of rejection because yeah. you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get a lot of rejections read a lot I mean not just the people that are here but um, there's so much good writing about personal finance right now. There's also a lot of crap, um, but you know, just the more you read, the more you know. Isn't that like a slogan for the library or something? <laughs> I was gonna say, don't, don't, don't be afraid to get into the weeds and, and to learn how things work. Um, you know, be it, be it breaking down, you know, what's within a mutual fund, what's within an ETF, understanding all the different layers of fees. Certainly even looking at like, life insurance and annuities, you know, don't be afraid to, to get nerdy and, and certainly don't be afraid to go and admit when you don't understand something. Um, you know, we're constantly learning. And of course, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, can you adequately explain this to your readers if you yourself don't understand it? So always be open to learning. That's great. Uh, could Darla, can I just ask you how uh, helpful is your CFP to you in your daily job? 
For sure. So, I mean, I would say it helps me come up with, with different ideas, but then also to, I would say it helps me think about the investor more holistically, if anything, and to, to think about just sort of the unexpected um, angles that, you know, for instance, some of our reporters might not immediately come up with. So just kind of going back to my example, as far as being really absorbed in like the day-to-day movement of the, of the market, think about what that might mean for the investor and not just, you know, Hey, I happen to be exposed to this particular fund. I'm in this stock, but then also what's the bigger picture. What does it mean for their taxes? What does it mean for, you know, even longer term planning, you know, is this, um, an investment that we have to go and track the basis, for instance. So there are all kinds of different slices that can come off of that. I feel like it helps you think a little more holistically about um, about your reader. Do you ever um, want to be a financial advisor, Darla? I mean, I know you play one on TV, literally, but do you want to <laughs> do you want to have clients someday and not do journalism? I mean, I'd, I'd never rule out like potentially being an an advisor. I I feel like a lot of it all kind of comes down to this issue of client education and and certainly reader education. And at the end of the day, those two missions are very much related. Um, So yeah, I mean, I feel like that would be my my approach to it, if anything. I would never rule it out, but- Furs open, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) I'd still come at it from this whole angle of, you know, well, education is empowerment for, for investors and for readers. Well, actually, I have a question. Uh, do you guys ever run into people who say you're practicing uh, financial planning or giving advice without a license that you're that you you should be trained to certified before you should be doing this? That ever come up? Especially if especially if it's giving advice to a particular person who writes in to you. I used to get that back in the 1990s, but maybe now that I have sufficient gray hair, I don't get it anymore. (laughs) It's only happened once and it was in the New York Times cafeteria. Um, There was a table full of people having lunch and one of them addressed the group and said, who is this new Ron Lieber guy like running around in the newspaper every weekend telling everybody what to do? And the person who said that at the table um, didn't realize that one of the people also at the table um, was my wife, who's also <laughs> a colleague. <laughs> that story made the rounds and <laughs> this poor person was never able to look me in the eyes again, or at least for years. Um, that was the only time. Uh, Ron's wife, Jody um, Cantor, for those who don't know, she also always says something which I is so true. And I think about it when I talk to you, Ron, and everybody else, like we're all in personal finance together. It's a very communal experience and we support each other in a way that I think it's not as competitive as some other areas of journalism are. Yes, good scoops are out there and whatever, but there is like, I think we're all altruistic at, in, in our hearts that we want to help people. And that's a different aspect of journalism, Lynn. Maybe, I don't know if you feel the same way in your experiences as a journalist in your career that you you come at it a little bit differently than your colleagues. Um, I, I uh, did feel a sense of a competition uh, with other publications, uh, and uh, my editors certainly did. And uh, if, uh, if something new came out uh, in this area and I hadn't written about it, uh, I would be asked why I hadn't written about it. Um, of course, I mean, I, I had friends at other publications, uh, and uh, especially through the New York Financial Writers Association, um, I knew people at many other publications. Um, but um, you know, when it came down to it, um, there was still the, the the pressure on to to, to get the story before anybody else did. Um, hey, Lynn, can I squeeze in a question here? Um, we're we're co- we're coming towards the end, folks. So if you have a question please write it into the chat. Um, I write about personal finance every now and then in my New York Times uh, econ news opinion section, econ newsletter. And I get some of my strongest reader response when I do. So I I could probably uh, really increase my readership if I switched even more to covering personal finance because there's such a 
such a strong interest in it, but since I approach it from an econ perspective, I wanted to ask you guys a question. So um, there, there are uh, this pretty small handful of economists who put a lot of attention into uh, personal finance. So Larry Kotlikoff, I think everybody knows, is, is a good example of that. Um, and so the economist will look at a product like annuities and say, what a natural idea. It makes them all the sense in the world. Or I think a lot of times personal finance writers will say, the fees are so high and they'll, uh, it, it strikes me as like a, coming at it from a different worldview. Both statements can be true, but um, I guess because I write about econ, I tend to be kind of bending over backwards to find a way to tell people that a well-chosen annuity can be a good choice, where sometimes personal finance writers are more in the direction of saying, beware of, of, of annuities. Do you, do you guys have any thoughts about that? And, and maybe even more broadly about the role of econ in general and uh, finance theory in general in personal finance? Well, I think in terms of the annuity question, it's there, the term annuity covers a multitude of sins. And so a lot of, when economists recommend annuities, what they're talking about are plain vanilla income annuities, which would you know, hand over a lump sum to an insurance company and you get a stream of income for life. And actually the embedded fees in those are actually relatively modest. And I'm a big fan of immediate fixed annuities. I've, I've written glowingly about them for two decades. Um, by contrast, I abhor variable annuities and equity index annuities, which are hugely expensive, have high back-end sales commissions, are sold by the lowest form of life on the planet in return for <laughs> you know, huge paychecks. So Being recorded, Jonathan. I, that's fine. I don't care. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to wake up in the morning and fire myself. I mean, what am I going to do? Um, so it, I don't think, I think in, in terms of annuities, it, it's actually... You know, we're talking about two totally different products here. Anybody else? I was going to say it's really important to make that distinction as far as um, using an annuity, the context of doing so. And yeah, I definitely agree on, on uh, those indexed annuities. The worst is when you actually run into advisors will say like, well, there are no fees. What do you mean? There are no fees on this product. And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Allow me to go and show you where this comes off of your returns, you know, or, or allow me to show you where this comes off of the uh, the cap that's applied to your uh, to your annuity. You know, it limits how much you can you can make off of it. So, yeah, um, there's definitely a huge difference between these more complex products, more costly products versus, you know, just a straightforward stream of annuitized payments. I think when uh, economists talk and they say uh, we like annuities or annuities are good, they're talking in theory. And, uh, you know, the concept of, of annuities, uh, if you write a definition of an annuity, uh, they would say, yeah, that's a good definition. But the actual practice and the actual uh, use of annuities in, in business uh, is totally different. And that's what uh, causes some of this confusion. This has been a great session. I loved having so many smart people who are so knowledgeable about personal finance gathering in conversation. This doesn't happen all the time. So this is this is a keepsake. This this video. Gotta take a we'll, picture. Yeah. yeah take picture. A picture. Everybody smile. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. And Lauren. Lauren, can we revive the picnic this summer finally? Yes. The personal finance picnic. I would love you to. We've invited. done personal finance picnic. You're all invited um, in Prospect Park. We have a spot. That would be really fun, Ron. Let's do it. Okay. I'll organize it because that's what I always do. I'm that's organizing. right. <laughs> we can collect the money. Well, um, <laughs> thanks, Len Sloan, for your years of uh, service to journalism. Yes. And Thank thanks you. to all the rest Thank of the panelists really for, for joining us. Nice to see so many familiar faces. Nice to see you all. Yeah, thanks.